First Samuel chapter 15. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Saul is the king. Saul is the choice of the people. Saul has not done right. Saul has been troubled. And he's going to be continued trouble. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the word voice of the words of the Lord. Hearken thou, Saul. Pay attention to what God's saying. Want we to do that. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Elimelech did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now let's look at some scriptures here. Deuteronomy 25, 17. We're going to see who this Elimelech is and what trouble he causes. And we're going to see from what passes from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, those that curse you, I'm going to curse them. And Deuteronomy 25, 17. We see, remember what Elimelech did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindermost, the end part of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. So here comes Israel out of Egypt, and Elimelech comes and attacks, and he starts taking off people in the rear, starts killing them. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God has given thee rest from all thy enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Limanek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. Now, we're in a time of Saul and there's semi-peace. And God's going to call this prophecy up and say, Saul, you're the one I want you to do this. You're the one. Exodus 17. Exodus 17. Elimelech's cup has been full. And I charge you, Saul, in verse, chapter 17, verse 8. Then came Elimelech and fought with Israel Rephidim. And we read about that in Deuteronomy. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out. Fight against him, Lech. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought in Elimelech. And Moses, Aaron, Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Elimelech prevailed. Oh, this is taught in the Sunday school. This is a wonderful story of the mightiness of God. That Moses, his hands are up in the air. There's victory in Israel. Oh, my arms are getting tired. They're getting, oh, gee, they're going down and Elimelech is winning. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and her stayed up his hand, the one on the one side, and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted, discomforted, didn't get rid of him. And Limelech and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book called Exodus, called Deuteronomy, called First Samuel. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Elimech from under heaven. I'm going to get rid of him. I'm going to get rid of his seed and his children. Now Genesis 36. Who is this guy? Genesis 36. Is a chapter about Israel. Enemy. Israel. Jacob's brother Esau. Edom. And you remember the time, oh, I'm so faint, oh, oh, you give me some of those beans. I'll give you some beans if you give me your birthright deal. Oh, 
If I get you some venison and, and bring it back, you'll give me the blessing, Father. All right. Father, give me the blessing. What? What happened? I already blessed somebody. What do you mean you blessed somebody? Somebody came and said you they were Esau, and I gave him the blessing. Oh, that was my brother Jacob, the third planter. I'm going to kill him. And Esau is an enemy of Israel. And we find in the family of Esau, check the verse here real quick, 36, 12. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. So Esau has a son called Eliphaz. And she bare him, she bare to Eliphaz a limonet. So Elimelech is of the children of Israel. He is born to Esau's son, making Elimelech grandson to Esau. And would it be one of the great things of grandpa to tell me on how bad Jacob was? How, oh, grandpa, you were so mistreated. And, oh, that great grandpa should have gave you the blessing and not to Jacob. And back in 1 Samuel 15. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Elimelech did to Israel. How he laid wait for him in the way. He got in the way of Israel. And was killing people in the Hinder Park. When he came up from Egypt. That's when Egypt, that's Israel came out of Egypt. Now go. Go. Move. And smite Elimelech, and utterly destroy all that he had. Utterly destroy all that he had. Utterly destroy all that they have. Utterly destroy all that they have. You got to get those verses because that will play out in the rest of this chapter. Utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman and infant. There's only two places in the Bible for that. Isaiah 65, 20. And that talks about infant of days. Here is infant and actual child. First and last time for an infant for a child. And a suckling, a child on the breast. Oxen and sheep and camel and ass this ascendants of esau are so wicked and so vile i want you to utterly destroy their name from off the earth deuteronomy 25 17 to 19 and Saul, i want you to do it their cup is full judgment has come And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Elam, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. He's ready. He's armed. He's got the men. He's going all out. Starting off good. And Saul came to a city of Elimelech and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, now these are the family of Moses' father-in-law. The Kenites and Moses father-in-law's son was recorded to go with Moses go and depart get you down from among the Amalekites at least I destroy you with them for ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt so here is that I will bless them that bless you I will curse them that curse you the Kenites helped Israel. They provided Israel aid in the wilderness. And God said, I like that. And I'm going to give you a blessing. And Limanek is killing them, fought with them. <coughs> he cursed Israel. And I'm going to curse him back. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, And Saul does not want to kill any innocent bystanders. He wants to make sure that it says over Re Revelation, my people come out from amongst them. Be separate. Get out from the sinners. 
Bible preached separation and division. Most churches will not. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havla until thou comest to shore that is over against Egypt. That would be good if we stop right there. We would think that there is complete obedience to what God has said. But we must go on. We must finish the chapter. And he, who's the he? Saul. Took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man, women, and but man. King Agag is a man. And they kept him alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. One percent disobedience. They have killed all the people, but they didn't kill the king. They're not done. But Saul and the people, so Saul and the people spared Agag. And best of the sheep, and of oxen, and of the fatlings, first time that shows up, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. For everything that was vile and refused, they destroyed utterly. Again, we must read verse 3. Go and smite in the neck, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and women, okay, not the man, the king, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Is not the commandment of God by Samuel to Saul clear? I guess not. Because they kept one man alive, and they kept the best sheep, the best uh, oxen, the best whatever for God. Saul is again trying to intercede into the priest's office because these animals that they save are animals that you sacrifice to God because it says, look, sheep and oxen, fatlings and lambs. Where's the camels? Where's the asses? There is no camel or ass sacrifice in the, in the Levi, uh, Leviticus or Deuteronomy. None. Matter of fact, with an ass, you're to redeem the lamb. If you don't redeem that ass, you're to break its neck. Why did he not save the best camel? Why did he not save the best asses? Because he wants to do a priestly service to God. And we're going to give God all the best. Because God will like the best. So, Saul is on the battlefield. Fighting. Samuel is somewhere else, and where he is, I don't know, but he's not with Saul. In verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, God speaking to Samuel, it repenteth that it repenteth me that I have met let, uh, excuse me. It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king. Now, in this moment, when Samuel is hearing God say, it repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, and Samuel's thinking in his mind, oh, Lord, what did he do? And it has to be something like that because there's a cloak colon. And the next part after that colon is an answer to, oh, what would Samuel be thinking? What did he do? Yeah, I mean, you're at home, the phone rings. Hi, this is the police department. We got your son here. And you'd be thinking, oh, no, what did he do? Uh, he was arrested for. So it repented me that I had set up Saul to be king. And you're thinking, oh, what did he do? And the Lord's going to answer, for he has turned back from following me. And has not preformed, the first time that word shows up, my commandments. And it grieved Samuel that he cried unto the Lord all night. Now Samuel doesn't know exactly what happened. 
He knows that God's angry with Saul. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place. That's an interesting place. And is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul. So now they're, they're meeting together to get together. And Saul said unto him, here comes Samuel, Saul speaks first. He's bluffing. Blessed be the Lord of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What words to say? But what did God tell Samuel that night, the night before? Verse 11, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Blessed be the, the Lord, I have performed the commandment. You're a liar. And Samuel knows you're a liar. Because God told him the night before he did not do what God wanted him to do. Samuel now knows, Saul, so you're a liar. And Samuel said, what mean it? Then, you've done everything God's told you to do. This bleeding of the sheep of my ears, the, the sheep sound, but, bless the Lord, but. And the lowering, the sound of the oxen, when I hear, I bless the Lord, I'm but, boo. Uh, I've done right. I've done blah, boo. Sam was over there looking at the animals and looking at Saul like, <laughs> and listening to what God told him. No, he didn't. And Saul said, now here comes the blame. Sam, uh, Saul is always blaming. He blames everybody but himself. They have brought them from the Amalekites. They, the, the soldiers over there, the Israelites, my people. They're at fault. It's the Republicans. It's their fault. It's the Democrats. It's their fault. It's Eve's fault. It's the serpent's fault. It's everybody's fault but my fault. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. Let's see what the Holy Spirit had to say in verse 9. And, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best. Okay, yeah, the people. But the Holy Spirit told us it was Saul too. Saul has become a Bible corrector. He omitted his name from what the Holy Spirit said with him. They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of oxen to sacrifice them unto the Lord thy God. Well, let's go back over here and say, utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, and ox and sheep, camel and ass. It repenteth me that I have set Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and has not perform my commandments that is verse 3 and we'll get more see there are more commandments out there than you know thou shalt not so what we did is we took the best animals the good animals and we brought them for God religion you see, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Well, that's, I'm not going to do what God said, but we'll do prayers. We'll do attendance. We'll give money. We'll, we'll be good people. What we'll do is we'll give God our best. We'll give God our goodest, and he'll be so happy. He would have to let us into heaven. 
But Jesus says, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You've got to do what God tells you to do. Or you're in trouble. And Samuel said to Saul, stay. And I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thy own sight, humble. And he was humble. Saul started off humble, but the office of the king, the office of the captain of the hose, he got in a little pride. Was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And he was. And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And he did. The people's choice. And the Lord set thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites. So you see why God said, verse 3, Why do I want you to get rid of them all? Because they are wicked sinners. Because they have defiled Israel. Because they have cursed Israel. They will not get right. The men, the women, and the children will not get right. And there's something wrong with their animals. Animals have been given to false gods. Animals probably given to bestiality. God says, I don't even want them. God doesn't want anything unholy and unrighteous. Sinners. The Amalekites. And fight against them until they be consumed. Yeah, but the king and the best sheep, the best oxen, and the best fat ones. Everything else, Saul did. But there are good butts and bad butts in the Bible. Here, the bad butt is Agag, the best sheep, the best fatling, and the best oxen. That's what defiled what God told him to do. Wherefore, then, didst thou not? Obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil. Now let's look at 1432. 1432. Now in 1432, they just fought another battle. And they're tired and they're hungry. And Saul has performed a curse upon the people, anybody who eats, to 6 p.m. You're under a curse. So by the time they come to this point, they're, they're in the spoil, they come upon the animals. And, uh, 32. And the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground and the people did eat them with blood. Now that flying upon the spot, I'm just so hungry, I'm starving and fasting because the king and uh, oh, hungry chop right into that cow and just began eating. And the Jews were forbidden under the law, we read that under that passage we go back to last chapter 14, message. They were so hungry they flew upon that spoil to relieve their starving and fasting. Here they're upon the spoil because they fly upon it because of lust and coveting. And God wouldn't want them to have this sinful stuff. It's probably given to idolatry, probably given to imagery, probably given to false gods. Probably like Jericho. No, you can't have any of that. But they fly upon the spoil with lust. And this evil in the sight of the Lord. Now here comes lies. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yet I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. <laughs> Move back. And I have met liars who actually believe the lies they tell. I have sat in a room when a man has lied to me. And I knew and would think that he knew what he said was a lie and he believed the lie that came out of his mouth. He 
It's amazing. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me. Uh, utterly destroy all and read the rest of the verse. If you utterly destroyed all, what are those sheep and oxen doing over there, Saul? Well, the people. The Holy Spirit said to Saul and the people. You're a liar. You're in trouble. And the way that people answer to trouble is lying. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Elimelech, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Then what is Agag doing there, standing there? What's he doing there? If you utterly destroyed all the men, what's Agag standing there for? If you utterly destroyed all the animals, why are there oxen and sheep over there? The fact is that Agag is standing there and those cows and, and, and animals are there. No, you did not do right. Now here comes the blame. But the people took up the spoil. Situation ethics. You know, my mom, my grandma, my great 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 grandma is the reason why. It was their fault. It's the ghetto I was in. It was an up, not proper upbringing. It was my family thing. It was because I'm colored. It's because of this. It's because of that. No! You gotta man up. And we got to realize that thou shalt not bear false witness. We will give an account, according to Matthew, by what Jesus said, we will give an account of every idle word. And those idle words are lies and they're not under the blood of Jesus Christ. They will come out at judgment. Because the Holy Spirit said, verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, oxen, fat men. The Holy Spirit has recorded for us, saw you had part in that. And the people. But the people took up the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed. So he's admitting his wrong, he's admitting his guilt, but he's lying to cover it up. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. Again, in that priestly office. They saved only the stuff that the priest would offer. Well, who would do the offering if Samuel didn't show up? Saul didn't know Samuel was coming. So who would have offered those sacrifices to God? Uh, 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 uh. Who already did it? It wasn't supposed to. Oh, let's see. Let me find that real quick. Chapter 13, verse 9. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made the end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And then Samuel balls him out. You're a wicked sinner. Samuel shows up, balls him out. You're a wicked sinner. And Saul lies back then and places blame back then, as he's doing now. So this is not the first time Samuel's done with done with Saul and his tactics. So, sacrifice unto God, thy God, and Gilgal. Twice he says, thy God and not my God. I'm not ashamed to say Jesus Christ is my God. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Would God really be pleased with all those sheep, all those oxen, and all those fatlings? Would God really be pleased with that? As in obeying the voice of the Lord. 
Would God want you to sacrifice all those animals? Or would he rather have you obey the voice, the word of God? You see, we'll give God religion, but we won't give him Jesus Christ. So if I give God religion, he, he's got to be pleased. No. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. God is not pleased. You can do all the prayers. You can do all the money. You can do all the church services. You can do the Christian thing. But it is not the word of God. Today, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. God's not going to be pleased. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken then the fat of Graham. Doing what God told you to do. Is what God wants. And anything else is sin. For the rebellion is as sin of witchcraft. And that's the first time witchcraft shows up. And it's associated with rebellion and sin. And we have Christians out there who are involved with Harry Potter, who are involved with the Blair Witch Project, and all kinds of witch and magic and sorcery. And the Bible, the first time that witchcraft shows up, is mentioned with rebellion and sin. How much more do you need to have to say it is not right for a Christian to be involved in witchcraft? I knew one person before they, they claimed to be a Christian and part of that Wicca. I told them you can't. And stubbornness, pride, unmovable before God is as iniquity and idolatry. You might as well just have a statue and pray down before that statue and flip the beads of the statue and clean the statue. When you're going to tell God, no, I'm not going to move. No, God, I'm not going to do it your way. That's iniquity. And Saul is in both. He's both in rebellion and stubbornness. And what does this rebellion do? It brings him to a witch later on. He will seek the advice of calling the 1-900 number for the witch of Endor. Because... Thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected thee from being king. And the words of Christ would be today for the church age. You rejected to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I will reject you. If you do not do what I told you to do. And that is to believe on Jesus Christ. That's the word. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. 2 Corinthians 7.10 2 Corinthians 7.10 2 Corinthians 7. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. And you'll stand before the, before the judge. Oh, Lord, judge, I didn't do it. I'm so sorry. Oh, judge, please give me one more chance, please. And you pull the tears in the fake routine. You're just really, really sorry. And he gives you a break. And you step outside the courtroom. <laughs> uh, he fell for it. Mom or dad's caught the child do something wrong. And the tears and oh, the boo-hoo. And oh, it's feel so sorry for you. Okay, walks off. <laughs> I won. But godly sorrow to the fact is, I am not going to repent that I done what God told me to do. If I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I am not ashamed I did that. Now, later on down the road, when I lied to that judge, I lied to my parents, I lied to somebody. I did not tell the truth. I may be sorry by my conscience for doing that. 
And yet my conscience will never be sorry. Romans 10. For believing on Jesus Christ. And Romans 10 verse 11. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. And we got to be careful of this easy believism because, oh, Saul said I've sinned, so Saul say this prayer and they should go to heaven. You're in danger. That guy may be sorry because he's been revealed. And I, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words. No, it's not thy word. It's not Samuel's words, Saul. It's the word of God. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. I have transgressed the command of the Lord and thy words. Not he doesn't say God's word. That's the sin. He has rejected the word of God, not the word of Samuel. So there is repentance before man of being sorry, but there's no repentance of God or to God. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He's a people pleaser. He is saying he's sorry because of the status quo of the people. And in his repentance, he is still blaming the people for why he's in the condition he's in. Because I feared the people, that's why I, I... That's not repentance. And that's not going to bring salvation. When you got somebody bowing their head and say, Lord God, I'm so sorry that this person made me do this, and because of this person I did this, and that's not... And say, Lord, I repent... Because I am the one that sinned. So that's not true godly repentance. That's, I got caught and now therefore I pray thee, thee, Samuel, pardon my sin. Ooh -ooh. He's done a Judas. He's doing what millions of people do in the Catholic Church. They go to another man and say, I have sinned. I have done this. I have done that. I've done this three times. I've done this four times. Forgive me, Father, for what I have done. Saul has turned to a man for the absolution of being cleansed of his sins. That the mediator is Samuel. But I was going to give a sacrifice to God. All these clean animals. And yet, with his mouth, he turns to Samuel and says, Samuel, forgive me for I have sinned. How many hell Joseph's do I have to do or Jacob's, whatever it is. Pardon my sin, talking to Samuel. And turn again with me. That I may worship the Lord. I need you to. I need you as a mediator between God and me. I need you, Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, "I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord." Look at that. Not my words, Saul. The word of the Lord. Let's get it right. Let's get it correct. And the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. You're done with. I'm done with you, Saul. Church discipline, you're out of here. I'm out of here. Separation from the world and from sinners. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid a hold upon his skirt. Uh-oh. A man wearing a skirt. Of his mantle and it rent and Samuel said to him the Lord has rent the kingdom from Israel from thee this day you know at that moment Samuel's walking away Saul grabs his skirt and rips and he turns to him and the Lord has ripped away thy kingdom from thee Samuel's mad
I don't want to hear any more pleas, so I've turned from you as God has turned from you. No more. I don't want to hear any more about it. And as you rip my skirt, your kingdom is rent. Great illustration. And has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Ooh, ooh. And that neighbor would be, as far as Benjamin, the tribe that he's from, would be Judah, the tribe. Benjamin will be swallowed up by Judah. But they are neighbors by the land grant. And also the strength, capital S, that's God of Israel, will not lie nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. Now I'm going to look back here. I got some verses. I'm going to give you the verses where God will not, cannot, is unable to lie. And you can write these down. We have a God that will not lie like man will lie. God cannot lie. I've heard preachers lie. God is unable to lie. I've heard Christians lie. I've lied. Psalms 89.35. Psalms 89.35. Revelation 21.27. Revelation 21.27. 1 Samuel 15, 29. Numbers 23, 19. Hebrews 6, 18. Titus 1, 2. Isaiah 65, 16. Verses where God cannot, will not, is unable to lie. He will not lie, Israel will not lie, nor repent. Well, over here it says in verse 11, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul. Oh, wait a minute, it repenteth the Lord here. And Samuel says the Lord will not repent, so there's a contradiction, and we must throw the Bible out. God can repent over the things he's done, like put Saul in office. He can repent that he made man on this earth over back in Genesis. But God over here in, in this face that a lie, God will never have to repent for a lie. God will never have to repent for, for a sin. God never sinned. God has never lied. God will never ever have to repent as far as him being unholy. Jesus Christ, sinless perfection, will never and had to never repent. For he never sinned. That's what that is. For he is not a man that he should repent. Now, Jesus Christ was a man, 100% man, 100% God. He was sinless. He was perfection. And yet he never had to sin. I mean, he never had to repent because he never sinned. So he was not just no ordinary man. He was God and he was man. Wonderful. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me now. Let's, guys in church, he's at their altar. Oh, Lord, I've sinned. Can you put me on the church plaque? Can you put my name in the bulletin? On this day of June 30th, 2018, at this time, at this altar, I receive Jesus as my Savior. Oh. That's what he's doing. Honor me. That is not the words of a man who's repenting right. I pray thee before the elders of my people. People pleaser. You see, they know what's going on now, Samuel. And I may lose a repetition of being a king, as you said. They may not respect me no more. They may not honor me no more. And please, Samuel, would you do something to help me get back my integrity and the honor of other men that I should receive? Whew. I've dealt with people like this. They're so high on themselves. And before Israel. And turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. I don't know why Samuel did that. I don't know why the Saul worshiped the Lord because it's not there. 
His heart's not there. He's only doing it for the people to say, oh, look at Saul. He's getting right with God. Oh, Saul, he's at the altar. Isn't he great? It ain't real. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Also, he comes back in the picture. Samuel took off, or tried to take off. And had Saul not ripped his skirt, I don't know if verse 32 would have happened. He said, okay, I'll put the show on for you. So everybody will be pleased. I believe Samuel's wrong on that. Oh, yeah, bring me Agag. Come here, sir. And Agag came unto him delicately. That's the first time that word showed. I mean, he's tiptoeing. He's walking night. <laughs> and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And what he said, Time heals all wounds. Come on, your anger ought to be over by now. Things have gotten better by now. Can't we just kiss and make up and be happy, lovely, and unity, and all the stars will come out and the rainbow, and everybody will get together, we'll sing Kumbaya, we'll all have a, 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 a cola, and, you know. And Samuel said, As thy sword, Agag, has made women childless, so he's killed men. Agag is a murderer. So shall thy mother be childless among women. So that, that gets mothers too. All right, your mother right now is going to be childless because you made mothers childless. You're going to die, buddy. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Let's look at chapter 15, verse 3. And now go and smite Elimelech and utterly destroy all that they have. Samuel is doing the word of God. He is healing that guy. He's given no account that that guy will be brought back to life. He's got that guy in pieces on the ground. And Samuel went to Ridma, That's his home. Saul went to his house in Gibna. That's his home of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul unto the day of his death. Samuel, just, that's it. I'm done with you. That's why I don't understand verse 31. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. Now Saul is not dead, but Samuel is mourning for him. Saul mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he made Saul king over Israel. What a mess of an end of the story of the Bible. All because one man would not do what God told him to do. I'm looking up a verse here I got. Let's see what it says. Amos 3.3. 3. Let's check out Amos 3.3. 3. See what we have here. Amos 3 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Not Samuel and Saul anymore. Why can't they walk together? Because he rejected the word of God. And Samuel has been faithful to the word of God since the first chapter of 1 Samuel. Samuel does what God tells him to do, Saul does not. And Samuel separated himself from the man that rejected the word of God. I don't know what Christians ought to do. You can't have the table of Belial and the table of the Lord. You cannot have Christ in Kotor. What fellowship with light with darkness? It only causes you trouble. And only get you mad, God mad at you. 